This is Weekly Woman by Jubilance for PMS. Annalise, it is so nice to have you on the podcast. I am kind of fangirling here <laughs> with like my love of The Bachelor. So <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I know we chatted like, I don't know, months ago, I feel like. And so I'm happy to finally be face to face kind of and, uh, and chatting with you. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here and for our audience to hear what you have to say, which is exciting. Um, So I just want to start things off with, um, tell us about where you're living now. So I'm up in San Francisco. I've, uh, since The Bachelor, been all over the place. I kind of, I think that's something that actually a lot of people didn't know about me, is I've always been a bit of a wanderlust. I'm from uh, Northern California originally, from the San Francisco Bay Area, but I, I travel a lot and live like all over the world. So I was actually living in Maui for nine months during the pandemic um, and I moved back in June. So almost a year ago, I've been back in San Francisco and, you know, I still try to like bebop up to Tahoe and get my adventure fix in, but, um, but yeah, up in San Francisco. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. I can't believe you lived in Maui. I I feel like I did the pandemic wrong. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it, but yeah, it was, I was, I was in San Francisco for a bit at the beginning of it. I was like, everything shut down. It was a total ghost town and it just was like very, you know, depressing. And so I was spending a lot of time in Tahoe um, because I, that's like a second home for me. And so that was great, but then everything was shutting down up there too. And then you're just like in the mountains in a cabin and you're just like isolated. So, um, so I was in a relationship at the time and it was like, well, what can, where can we go where we can still feel very like normal, you know? And that was, (laughs) that was the place that we had chosen. That's amazing. Wow. So originally I'm from New York City. So um, I kind of did the whole thing of like flying back and forth between California and there, because like you said, like San Francisco, it was no one was there. Um, Very like dystopia like which is right. very creepy I had I went to Hofstra on Long Island so, um, oh. so I have a lot of friends in New York and they were saying this the same thing they were like it was just like a weird um you know post-apocalyptic like very strange world to be there yeah Annalise I didn't know you went to Hofstra my sister went there no way yeah she played on the volleyball team so cool yeah Um, it's such a lovely area I love Garden City Mm -hmm. yeah I know it feels like forever ago (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, for me too (laughs) let's move past that (laughs) like I don't even yeah it was it was great no I I actually did really enjoy college and I I love my time in New York I spent a couple years living in the city after and I loved it I I mean I'm so grateful now because I have all these friendships back there and so it does give me like a great excuse to go back and but all my friends of course now have moved it's like San Francisco moved out of the city because they're all onto the the marriage and babies phase of their Mm -hmm. life so they're like in the suburbs but it's still I mean it's great yeah and and speaking of marriage and family, so you signed up for The Bachelor, you were on Ari's season. Um, can you talk about that process? Like, what was the audition like? What what made you sign up for The Bachelor? Um, it was a very weird time. I was 32 and uh, I was single and I, I was just, I mean, I don't know, like, I, there was so much going on in my life, but, um, I was like starting my own business. I had just bought a house and was like in the middle of remodeling it. I had just done like a six month solo trip. I was like doing a lot of crazy stuff. My head wasn't really in it, but I was single. And I got a phone call one day saying, we just had five people in our office say you need to find this girl and get a hold of her. And so I was like, I mean, there's no way they're going to pick me. That was my first thought. And so I was kind of like, I'm just going to go along with it. Like, I'll see where this goes. Um, And, but I mean, like I said, I was doing so much stuff on my, you know, outside of that. It really wasn't like a priority for me at all. But, um, and I was like, I had just, I remember like, I hadn't told anyone because I was, I was a little bit like, I don't want to hear what people are going to say about it. I was a little embarrassed that I was even going through with the audition process at the time. Um, And I had just gone on a big trip with my family and we had gotten back from Africa and I like got the call. And then like a week later, I I 
left basically. Um, but yeah, the audition process was just, it was one of those things that they kept calling me and they kept saying like, okay, we'd like to invite you to this next round. But it was like a six month process for me. It was a long audition process. And that's why I didn't really tell people either. Cause I was like, when they first contacted me, um, it was probably like in March or something. And then I didn't, you know, we left for filming in September. And so mm -hmm. I was like that entire time, I'm like, they're not, you know, it, there's so many girls that go out for this. There's so many girls they're talking to. I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to get my hopes up or get too excited or tell people, but yeah. <laughs> and then they were like, do you want to come? And I'm like, I mean, why not? I remember it was like, literally my house was gutted and my mom was like, like, I, you have contractors, like, what do I tell them? And I was like, I don't know. I trust you, like make executive decisions here. But, um, it is funny. I think back on it and I'm like, I really, my head was not in it because mm. I worked, I was like doing event planning very like, um, my schedule was super busy with that. So I was like, I did an event. I was until I think 2 AM the night before I had to leave. To wow. Go home. I just like, wasn't, I, I think as much as I like wanted to be, I was just like very, I didn't give myself time to like Zen out and prepare for it mentally. I think I would just went into it, like with all these outside stressors. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, well, it's amazing <laughs> back on it now. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and of course that's just part of your story because like, as you said, you're a wanderer, you have your own event planning business. You just wrote a book, which is amazing. Um, so, uh, but, but I know that's what our audience knows you from. Um, and then you were also on the bachelor in paradise twice. Um, can you talk about going to Mexico and what that was like? Um, I, I mean, was just bizarre. Like, again, I'm like, how is this happening? Cause I was, I was then 33 when I went to paradise and it's just like, not at all what I imagined, you know, for myself, <laughs> my younger self. Um, but it was so fun. And I think the reason I, I went the first time was just like, I, I knew who I I know who I am at the core and how I was presented in The Bachelor. And um, and I don't know, I think there was just a part of me that like wanted my own little redemption story. I had so many friends that were like, I couldn't even watch you on The Bachelor because it just wasn't you, they edited mm -hmm. you so much. And so I was like, maybe this is a good opportunity for me to, to like also meet a bunch of people. And like, it was kind of like summer camp. It was so fun. Yeah, um, why not? Yeah, and you get like so 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 much uh, more opportunity to get to know the girls and the guys, and uh, it really is like it kind of is like going to I don't know what I would imagine like sandals, like one of those resorts would be <laughs> where it's like a bunch of singles, like you know everyone's single and everyone's looking potentially for a relationship, and you're just like no care in the world. I mean, they the producers definitely like give you lots of cares in the world while you're there, and you're stressing about things you probably shouldn't be, but you know, you're laying on the beach and you're drinking and eating and just, it, it's fun. So um, the first time around, I really was like, I'm going to be so open. And I think um, that's some, an edit that I got afterwards that I was really frustrated with is people were like, you're so desperate, you'll go for anyone. And like the thing for me was, it wasn't a desperation thing. It was that in the real world, I am very picky. And so this was my opportunity to be like, I'm going to give everyone a shot. I'm going to really, really try my hardest to not be like, I'm not physically attracted. So bye. Or, you know, we had one bad conversation. So bye. Like I wanted to, I wanted to really try to get to know people and, um, and be as open to other types of people as possible. And then of course I went for like my total type, which was coming out. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, I guess that's why we have types. Sometimes you go for like what you're attracted to and, and uh, you know, hindsight, um, some of these other guys were great guys, but, uh, but yeah, that was the, that was my whole agenda. I was like, I'm going to try to really be open to the process. And, um, and then, and then, yeah, the second time again, I think I was just, I was like, okay, I get it now. I get what they're doing. I get the process. Like I know what's going on. And, um, and I went back with like, with high hopes of, of like, I got this. And then, um, I mean, there's just always, there's so many things not shown also yeah, on, of course. on camera. So, um, so it was tricky because I really was feeling confident that 
the second time around. I, I thought that I was getting, I was told I was getting the rose. I was like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to continue to get to know you and like date you. And then, um, went home night one there. So that was kind of a bummer, but at the same time, again, hindsight better off for it. Yeah. And what an amazing experience. Just so fun to be a part of that and something like a part of your story, just like a small part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It definitely is. I think it's, I think it's, it's something that I, there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Like there's a part of it that's like, I, I love that this is part of my story, but then it is something that we are just like, you know, everyday people. And so then we go back into life and it does like change things for sure. And I know some people, mm-hmm. they become fan favorites and like get the million followers and then they go on to having like huge deals and that becomes their, their new reality. But then there's also like the me people who kind of go back into normal life we still get a little bit of that like fun, um, you know, publicity and and we get to go to red carpet events and stuff. So that's like fun, but it's definitely like, I would say my life is pretty normal. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, it's not glamorous at all. Especially the past couple years. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I don't think anyone's life was glamorous the past couple of years, which is (laughs) horrible. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, uh, except for yours in Maui. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to red carpet events. I, yeah. I was like, no makeup and no shoes. That was me <laughs> for nine months. <laughs> that sounds ideal. <laughs> yeah, way okay. better than red carpet. Yeah, exactly. I like yeah. I like balance though. I think like I've always said, I'm a, a bit of a Renaissance woman. Like I like to mm-hmm. I like the getting down and dirty, like, you know, in the woods or being just this like hippie barefoot girl. But then I'm also the girl that likes to get super dressed up. So it's like, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take you to a gala yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just have one more question about The Bachelor and then yeah. we'll move on to something else. But um, so we're a period company um, based in women's health and PMS. And so I was curious. So as there are like a million girls on The Bachelor, can you talk a little bit about like menstruation in the house? Like it, does everyone sync up? Is like everyone PMSing at the same time? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny. <laughs> the night that I went home on RE season, I think I wasn't supposed to get my period for like another two weeks or something. And I got it like that night in the hotel after being sent home. And I was just like, well, there you go. Like if I would have known this, I could have adjusted, you know, because I think when you know you're getting your period, you kind of are like, okay, this is, this is all part of it. Like I am emotional because of this. You can rationalize a little bit more, but I was like, Mm -hmm. this is coming out of left field. I don't know why I'm having these crazy emotional reactions to these things. And then, yeah, I realized that, but yeah, we all see it. We all synced up. Um, I almost feel like the bachelor producers, like you know, they know every, they know more about you probably than you know about yourself when you go in because you do psych evaluations and all of these medical things. And so, um, I'm sure they knew what our cycles even were and knew how to kind of like, uh, make those times a little bit more dramatic or, you know what I mean? (laughs) Reactions, but I definitely felt that way. And it's just, it's hard. Like for me, I definitely, something I've really like grown from a lot since, since all of it is this notion of comparison. I think when I, when I first did it, um, after night one, I was the oldest one in the house and that like, just, I don't know, messed with my head. And I don't have, like, I don't have ageism for other people, but I definitely had it for myself. Like I just felt in the moment, like I was just really comparing everything to girls that were Um, like Becca on my season was 22 and I, so I was 10 years older than her and he was Mm -hmm. 36 or something at the time. And so I was having this like real issue in my own weird subconscious going on of like, he's 36, he's going for a 22 year old. So what's wrong with me? Is it because I have these lines? Is it because I'm, and then of course, like afterwards, like, you know, I was feeling bloated and, and all of these things. And I didn't really realize that it was because I was getting my period. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's definitely like, I feel like the, the 
period portion of like syncing up and all of that, everyone is probably going through the same thing, but like, we all have our own insecurities about it. Like, I know for me, I just like, I get bloated, I get emotional, I get really cramped. Like I get all the symptoms at a, <laughs> oh. you know, 13. Um, so I was just, I think I was somebody who was just like really feeling it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like I can... Nervous breakdown. <laughs> I cannot even imagine being around everyone who's PMSing. I know mine is terrible usually, so I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, it was not fun, but yeah, I, I think, and then um, trying to think with paradise, I don't really remember, oh, I don't remember what was going on like with my, with my cycle then. I may have just like missed it the whole time. I know a lot of girls that were on birth control were just like, skip it for the entire time mm. um but I wasn't ever on birth control when I was on I stopped taking it I want to say like right around maybe maybe 31 or something I stopped taking birth mm. control so my like when I was on birth control it was very like you know every 28 days yeah. at 11 a.m or whatever it was like so precise um so I think, yes, and, and you could skip it and whatnot with like how you're taking your dosage, but I didn't have that luxury. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for going there. I was so curious and I know our listeners will be as we talk about like different menstruation issues and period poverty a lot on this podcast. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, veering <laughs> off into a different way. Can you tell us about your book? Tell us, tell us what you've written and where we can find it. So uh, it's called AP Unwritten, and it is a collection of my art and poetry in sort of this like journal. Uh, I want it to feel very much like it's your own journal though too. So I want readers to be able to pick it up and to draw along or to be inspired to write their own poetry. And I wrote this, it was really, it was birthed out of heartbreak for me. Um, I always say like my my heartbreak became my muse in a way. Um, so at the beginning of when I had moved to Maui, um, I had just, the, the, the guy that I was supposed to move to Maui with broke up with me like days before moving there. So I was quarantined in a house for two weeks by myself, <laughs> like in the house we were supposed to live in that we had signed a six month lease. And so I was like, I don't know what, but um, I'm a creative person and all of the creative juices just started really flooding me. Like I couldn't not think in poetry. It was bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I work. Like I, I am a painter and sometimes I go through these phases where I just like paint eight hours a day and I'm like in wow. it. But so that's how I felt about writing. And, um, and I've never really considered myself like a writer per se, but then I got a publisher and um, like months later they were saying, uh, you know, like, do you have any other poems, whatever? And I looked back in my notes, I had written poetry months before, like, you know, and, and it's just something that I think I hadn't ever really dialed into as like a full, full, um, creative outlet for me. It was just something I would do every once, once, once in a while. And it's funny. Cause now I think like back to a kid, as I was as a kid, I always like would write songs and, you know, it's just wow. kind of, it's a, it's a form of poetry really in a, in a lot of ways. So, um, so yeah, so it's a, it's, it's journey, it's a journeying through love, heartbreak and healing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and then for a lot of people who, who either know my story or don't know it well, I think through the bachelor process, I went through obviously a lot of heartbreak um but then outside of the show as well I went through a lot of like other heartbreaks like my dad passed away um oh, at, so right sorry. after thank you right after um we like it, it was two weeks after uh paradise the reunion show had aired so it was like oh. I got hit with a lot of things I had just gotten broken up with and then um and then my dad and so there was like a lot of a lot of things that were kind of constantly hitting me and I went through a very uh dark Point where I was feeling super depressed and um and it's like the last couple of years I felt depression and anxiety so much more and so this was really just a way for me to hopefully connect with people who are I mean there's so many things that it's like hopefully connecting with people like I'm neurodiverse yeah. so it's like hopefully because I, I write it for a neurodiverse mind so it's not complete sentences it's like it's how I think you know and so 
I want somebody to be able to pick it up and either be neurodiverse and feel like, oh, I relate to how this writing style is, or somebody who is, who's going through a heartbreak, whether it be death or a relationship or a friendship or something like that, and, and be able to uh, see themselves in it. And so, um, and I've already, like, it's so exciting. It came out uh, February 22nd. And so it's out, you can, um, you can buy it on my, my link in, uh, link in bio in my Instagram account. Um, it's for sale on Amazon and, but it's so cool. I'm already having people reach out to me and say, like screen, you know, send a picture of a page and just be like, oh my gosh, this is, I so resonate with it. So it's really cool getting that feedback already from people that I know it's, it's helping. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. And so interesting that you were able to channel like these darker times or times of COVID into something creative and something that um, you can help others with, which is so cool. And yeah, Annalise, and I need really it. need this. <laughs> <laughs> I need this book. I am also going through heartbreak, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but that sounds great. I, yeah. I will be looking it up right after this. Yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully it helps. Um, that was, I mean, that's my main goal in it is like I, and I think it's just a way for me to strip away a lot of the things that are very learned, especially as women, um, like this notion of perfectionism and mm. having, I've always had like this sort of perfect complex. And so I didn't want it to be perfect. You know, there's a lot of things in it that I, if my old self was writing it, I would have changed and wanted to be different but I want it to really be able to speak to like somebody who's never written poetry and feel like oh I could write that also I also want it to speak to people who you know maybe love poetry and are avid po poetry readers or are really familiar with it and feel like oh that is you know there's like a good good a couple good ones in there too I want it to really like speak to um, a wide range of people so that it can really help somebody out there you know and and that's really the goal in all of it is like we what do they say you're um like you're you're the best teacher in like the things that you know you've gone through yourself so I feel like mm. in a lot of ways now that I've gone through so many hardships on my own that I'm like this is my chance to actually take my grief and and um and turn it into something that can help other people Wow. That's awesome, Annalise. And something that we all need to look up, whether it's what, what you were saying of grief of a relationship, a death, or just even this time, I feel like everyone is grieving in some fashion, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, with the madness of like the political sphere and also the pandemic. Yeah, um, and something you brought up while you were talking was um, this notion of womanhood and like this idea that we've all been uh, forced to be perfect all the time. Um, something that I always ask on this podcast is what is your definition of womanhood? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, wow. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a hard hitter one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I guess I've never really thought about it for, I think it's changing so much too, mm -hmm. because now with like non-binary or, you know, like the pronouns, um, I feel like uh, you know, it's definitely, it's not the body that you're born into. It's, it's this, like, this energy of, I don't know, like, the, the thing that's coming to mind is just, like, this energy of Mother Earth. Like, I feel mm. like um, it's just this sort of nurturing energy that you're connected somehow too but then you know it's it is so hard because I hate labeling anything and it's like I feel like there's men that are are like that as well yeah. so I don't want to say that but men can have feminine energy so I think being you know being like connected to your womanhood is is not necessarily like defined by being a woman I do think like being a woman we are we're, we're we can carry babies we can you know do all these things that are so incredible um so there's also like that aspect of it that we just are born creators like that's so um mm. and I think for everyone it's so different too yeah I, I love what you said about we're born creators because that's sort of what you're doing with your book of creating or creating your steps of life, like how you were saying before the bachelor, you did like a million things. 
Um, but womanhood, of course, is constantly changing. I think like our definition from like second to second is probably shifting and changing. Um, this podcast has changed from the beginning of it, of like being called a weekly woman to now including so many different other types of menstruators and people who identify with femininity or womanhood. Um, so I love that idea of this creator and what does that mean for us as women? Um, yeah, and, we're all, and we're always just, even for me as a woman, I feel like my definition for myself has changed a lot in, you know, especially in like the last 10 years, the last five years, the last probably six months, like, you know, it's always changing. Yeah, as we should be, I think. And mm -hmm, that's, that's what's so empowering is that we can change. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I think uh, a, a question I also like to ask is um, if a woman like walked up to you and uh, asked for your advice on like anything in the world, you just like met her on the street. Um, <laughs> what would you say to her? Uh you know, it's so funny. I had somebody from my team ask me this the other day. Huh. I was like, I, oh my God, I don't, it's so hard. I'm, I think this is so something that I've done int really interesting. I think um, recently is I had my brain studied <laughs> um, huh. because I'm neurodiverse. And I think there's just certain questions like this that I cannot like, it almost just becomes um, jello in my brain. I'm like, I can't figure, I can't, I can't picture who that person is. I can't, but I know that if I saw somebody, if, if this did happen, because it's happened plenty of times before where I've had to either jump into action and actually help somebody or somebody's asking for, yeah, some sort of advice and specifics I'm really good at, but, um, but the sort of like generalness of it, I have a hard time. So that's like me being fully honest and real with you. Um, I don't know. I, I think, um, I would probably give really good advice though. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> a more specific kind. Yeah. I know. Um, no, I, I don't know. It's so weird. I'm, I'm, I think the thing that's cool about learning about yourself and how your brain works, um, specifically me, because my brain just works differently is mm. I'm, I'm trying to own it a lot more and not, uh, I think I've so much of my life had to, and that's part of like the perfectionism part of me is that I'm really good at, uh, pretending like I understand or uh -huh. like, um, showing up and being present and all of these things, but, um, but it's so much work and it's very exhausting for me. And so I'm trying just to be a lot more honest about that because it's the truth. And like, you know, I think it's, um, it's important because I'm realizing how many people, when I do bring these kinds of things up, how many people are like, I'm the same way. Um, oh, wow. so I'm good at like, I think on The Bachelor and people, you know, I've done so many podcasts and things. I'm good at like on the fly coming up with things, but mm -hmm. it like, it's exhausting yeah. Um, yeah. for my brain to do that. So, and I mean, I'm sure it is for other people too, but, um, but yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's great that you can be a voice for people who are neurodiverse and like have this book that's coming out that hopefully you're saying that people can read it. Um, but also just like tell your story and tell this, um, tell us how we all are different. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing at the end of the day is just embracing what makes us different and then looking at it in a way that makes, makes you see yourself and, and, and maybe, maybe others, but who cares what others see is, um, is like the superhero powers that are within all of us. You know, I think the thing that I'm realizing so much too, is I have so many friends recently who have children who have been diagnosed with some sort of, um, uh, you know, neurodiverse, uh, hmm. like ADHD, um, central auditory processing disorder, you know, different things that I've also been diagnosed with. And so I think for me, it's really important because as a kid, I never had any, like we, ha I always, I think about myself and I'm like, I have full representation. I am a white blonde girl. I have been represented my whole life, but, but there's really like, there's so much more than, um, than just how we see people about representation. So like, mm -hmm. I've never known people, especially as a kid that were neurodiverse. Um, 
And it always was like, it always just became this stigma of like, oh, you're not smart. You're not trying hard enough. You're not, you know? Mm. Um, so I always had to keep up with my peers and try. And I think that's where this perfectionism was really born in a lot of ways too. Cause I was always trying to keep up and I was trying so hard to appear as if I was as good as ever, as good as everyone. But I, you know, my, my brain was really challenged to keep up. And so as much as I would try, it wasn't, it was never really good enough. Um, mm. And now I'm recognizing that, no, it totally is, you know, it's, um, but it's just, it's just a different way of thinking. And then I can be a voice and, a, and to some, to kids who are like, you know, one of my girlfriends, her mom um, is able to say like, look at what Annalise is doing. And she has a brain that works like yours, you know? And so it is kind of cool to be that for, for somebody else. That's awesome. Yeah. I love what you're saying about representation matters and how are we representing like these things that we don't see as well? Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that I talk about um, with my own like personal, I had a breast reduction when I was 17. And again, that's like something that I feel like is not really talked about. And I think mm -hmm. the combination of the neurodiverse um, and then the, the body issues, these are, these are, these are common threads of, uh, that a lot of people have. Mine are just like, you know, specific to me and everyone else has their own specific things that maybe are dealing with different, different issues. But for me, it's like, it really has played a huge role in my self-esteem because it's, it's, um, I've always been kind of told that my body is like this object and I'm not smart. And so as like a kid, that really, really plays on you. And so as an adult, I'm rewiring, I'm reworking, I'm trying to do like AP unwritten, you know, my book, it's like, I'm, I'm really like unwriting. I'm, I'm kind of rewriting who I am and like what it is to, to be a woman, to be me, to be neurodiverse, to have a body that maybe you don't feel a hundred percent comfortable in, even though I'm fully represented. And so, you know, it's, um, and I, and, and I'm so glad that like representation is becoming so much more of, um, of like a forefront issue. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of things that are not represented and mm -hmm. there's, and it's like depression, anxiety, neurodiversity, um, the scars that maybe we don't see or the, you know, diseases that are, that we don't see. There's a lot of other things that people are dealing with on a day to day that it's important for people to feel like there's other people like them. <laughs> yeah. And I think you're doing a great job with AP Unwritten because you're creating this book that like is your, I, like your baby, I guess. I, <laughs> um, but, but as you were describing how you write and how you read this and how you like do these paintings and these drawings and asking other people to fill them in or to add to it. Um, is like making space for both your own um, representation of who you are and what is there on the page and what's going to be on it from the next person, which I think is really cool. So you're actually creating a book for all kinds of different things to be on that page. Yeah, I know. I'm, ex I'm excited because, you know, it's, it's still so new that it's been out, but, um, but that's, the, that's the next step that I'm super excited to see when people are sending me like the poems that they've written or the drawings that they've created. Uh, I think that'll be really fun. So I'm excited for that. that. Is cool. That's like the next step, I feel like. Yeah. So we've heard about the next step for AP Unwritten. What's the next step for you? What are you doing next? Uh, I mean, there's, I feel like it's funny with this book coming out, I thought, oh, well, everything's going to kind of slow down for a little bit. And I feel like it's been the opposite. It's, it, I mean, it's been, AP Unwritten has been two years in the works and, uh, and I feel, I, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm going to take a little break after this comes out. No, it's like the opposite. I feel like the universe is, is gifting me with a lot of opportunities. And, um, and so I do have a lot of things coming up and, and just, I'm continuing to, to learn, like I said, like getting the brain scans and doing things that I think are just going to help me to, um, to continue down this path of, of being able to be representation to, to somebody, um, to a group of people. So, uh, I am excited to see where it goes, but at the moment 
there's no like I don't have any big next steps. I'm I'm not cool. moving or <laughs> taking yeah. any trips or doing anything too exciting. But um, but there's a there's a lot kind of in the in the works at the moment, which is always exciting. That is awesome. And Annalise, is there anything else you'd like to add to our listeners today? Um, I mean, this is not a, this is not like a sponsored post or anything, but I know you guys are all about the menstruation and I gotta say, I'm like the biggest, biggest fan of, uh, period underwear. So invest in some, I know it's expensive, but, um, I don't know if you guys have talked about it before on the podcast. I'm sure you have, I'm sure your listeners are very familiar. Um, but that's, that would be the one period advice I would give to you. I think it's a game changer. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I have tried it. It is great. Um, I especially love it when I'm hiking. I'm just like, I don't have to worry about a tampon at all. I'm like still able to be in the mountains and everything is okay. (laughs) For me, it's like sleeping or working from home. It's just like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. I think it's, I mean, for me, it's like, uh, just our carbon footprint is, is lower with, you know, we don't have all this like plastic and whatever that we're, uh, but then also it's, I don't know. I feel like I'm not putting anything in my body and I really like yeah. that. <laughs> that. That is good. Yeah. For us, um, what our company does, it's called Jubilance for PMS and it's specifically for the emotional side of PMS, emotion, like anxiety, stress, irritability and gloominess. So hopefully that would like, we could like send some to the bachelor mansion. Um, Honestly, they probably would ship it back because they want that. That's the drama they are feeding <laughs> off of. That's why you guys all keep coming back to watch more <laughs> for the drama. Um, but yeah, afterwards, I think people, <laughs> yeah. should be like a little. we don't get goodie bags or anything like that. I always imagine you'd show up at the bachelor house and there'd be like s- presents for you, but there, there's not. But but that's like something that should be shipped to everyone after the fact. Like, oh my thank gosh. you so much for participating in your social demise <laughs> or whatever <laughs> your edit just was. And here is uh, some jub- jubilance. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, jubilance. To, to, uh, to get you through the next couple months as it airs. <laughs> yeah, to help you not stress. I just imagine like a luxury, like, like tent outside, like near the pool where like you guys get massages and are just like, like, oh, here's some jubilance to like not stress. But I guess that's like completely the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a different show probably. I don't know what yeah. that would be, but um, <laughs> no, I'm sure a lot of it is, it is interesting. Cause I, I have heard from many other girls, guys that have been a part of the show that they do struggle with like anxiety and depression quite a bit more post show. Um, and I think also like the last couple of years, you know, mm-hmm. I, a lot of people are just dealing with things and it's been, it's been, a, it's been a lot, yeah. but I mean, that is something for sure. I only recently, um, got medicated for, um, for like ADHD and, and anxiety. And, but before that I could have totally, totally use some, I probably could still use some of that. Let's be honest. Great. Annalise, I'll ship it to you today. You can try it and see what you think. Yeah. Anything to calm the anxiety always. Amazing. Well, it was so great to have you on today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It was fun chatting.